Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Medina with Envision Advisors. And today we're going to talk about investing in new construction in northern Colorado. There are some great opportunities to be able to get um, equity at the purchase from anywhere from up to $30,000 all the way up over $100,000. But investors need to know the kinds of things about new construction that are different than resales or, or fix and flips. So we're going to talk about the pluses, minuses, and the important considerations that investors need to know in purchasing new construction in Northern Colorado. And so with me today, we've got a couple of guests, partners in crime, whatever you like to call them, but it's Newt Weiler, who's our broker and vision advisor partner up here, and Troy Howell, who is our loan officer for Nova Home Loans. And so I'm going to invite them in and say hello and, uh, you know, how are you guys doing today? Good. 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 Nice to meet you, Steve. Newt. Nice to see you guys. The beauty of technology. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through and I'm going to set up just a little bit about what's going on in the new construction market and, and why it's important for investors to think about new construction that they might not have thought about before. So let's take a quick look. I'm going to put this up. So when we look at our strategies and I'll try and clear just a little bit of this. When we look at the strategies that are working today in a higher interest environment, we're seeing still that long-term rentals, you know, is kind of one of the straightforward one and house hackers. So those are two of the still, you know, opportunities there. What is challenging is to find the right deal at the right price to get it to cash flow. But there are some opportunities to buy equity at the beginning. And here's why, because we're seeing that now new builds are making up one third of the houses on the market. Traditionally, they're about 10 to 14 percent. So they're double that because new construction is, uh, I guess, uh, coming from a zero entry point where a resale is somebody that has it. They might have a good um, interest rate and they're concerned that the interest rate environment today is depressing that that opportunity to sell their house at the best price. So we're going to talk about a handful of things today about what things are benefits about new construction, what things are challenges, and then some key observations that investors need to know in order to be able to make the right choice to buy new construction and put it in their portfolio to grow their wealth. So I'm going to flip back to our group here, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the benefits of new construction. And so Newt and, and Troy, you guys have been doing this uh, a long time. What are some of the things that you guys think about, like, leveraging incentives and some of the um, uh, some of the discounts that are going on today with new construction. And new, you have a pretty good idea on this stuff, and we can show a couple of examples in a minute. But what are you seeing out there with some of these new builds? Yeah, well, uh, Troy could probably speak to how the interest rates have uh, been a little bit of a challenge for certain certain people. But, yep. uh, you know, it, being able to have builders that are – are able to uh, bring down those prices a little bit. That's great and all, but those builder incentives are a uh, dollar for dollar uh, value that a lot of investors or homeowners or whoever can take right away. Take for instance, putting in a yard or a fence or adding AC if it's not something that they traditionally do in their contract uh, as a standard feature. Those types of things are a good dollar for dollar hit that uh, you can finance, which is nice. And I know, Steve, you uh, have always been a fan of that in your investment opportunities is to just be able to roll that into the loan as long as it's making the numbers work. Seems to be a good fit. Yeah, and that's what I'm, I see out there. I did a bunch of um, calls and went and looked at some new um, construction developments this week. And, you know, you see um, different kinds of builders. So there's the big national ones, that are you know huge and production oriented and and they're kind of moving to just spec so they're building it it's got all it's in it and then they don't really offer anything outside of that and so that's the to me it's like goldilocks and the three bears you have the the big ones the papa bears that are out there and then you have the baby bears that are the small inside uh local market that just build a handful and they aren't necessarily able to have kind of the big discounts so what they do is they're building kind of when they get the contracts. And so they're slower. They manage their subs differently. 
And then there's this middle tier that there's a few of them around in Northern Colorado that they don't have the big sophistication of the giant builders, but they have the productivity, they're production builders. So they're building it out. They have great subs and they've maintained them all through COVID. And they're able to say, let's keep these crews working. And they're willing to put pricing on the table and some other incentives because they don't have access to some of the loans that some of the bigger builders have. So, you know, that's where, you know, you're seeing kind of those different ones. And that's where we tend to spend our time trying to understand where those opportunities are at. So, um, Troy, what are you seeing with some of the new builds, some of the benefits of buying new construction that you're seeing? Yeah, I think um, something you're probably going to touch on and, and bring up is they they provide an opportunity to buy down the interest rate for you to make it attractive, to make the pay, payment more manageable on the price point. And so taking advantage of some of those incentives when they've bought out or bought down, uh, the interest rate obviously is is very helpful. But like Newt was talking about, you know, the incentives to uh, improve the property or give you some discounts. Uh, on some improvements, finishing things out, like like you were saying, Newt, doing the yard work, or um, I don't know what you're seeing up north, but where they offer like, hey, we're going to do the basement uh, for you can finish out a basement or something of that nature is, is huge because that's like you're saying, it's an equity builder, equity grab right out of the box. Yeah, I just um, I, I went by Revere um, a couple of days ago and met with one of the builders that has some some houses up. They're getting very close. They'll be ready in December. And I got a text the following morning saying, hey, you know what? Our management's going to offer, you know, refrigerator, washer and dryer. You know, they have high end stuff and, and some of them have front and back landscaping because they need to move them. Because if they stall out, they're start not starting to hit some of the targets they need to. So they're willing to take a little hit on margin to be able to do that. Um, it's interesting. Um, I'll show you a couple of the deals that I've seen uh, over the last week and a half. So I'm going to go ahead and show um, one more slide forward. Um, but these are some that are in different parts of northern Colorado. But you see there's one that's over $118,000 off the list price. Now, this is for everybody that's an investor to consider. Is that list, list price realistic or is it a false front? We have to look at that too, because that's kind of what um, we need to do as investors to understand it. But there's others out there that are you know, $82,000 off. And when we look at some others that are up here that um, you know, have opportunities with another builder that's up here, you know, we're seeing you know, anywhere from 50 to $40,000 off and they're also providing a 3% seller concession that they can do a rate buy down or they can use it to offset those um, items like, you know, landscaping and that that certain builders do. So it's you have to know which builders are do, offering which things and, and then how best to organize that for your um, for your I guess, investing priorities. So um, I tend to like everything baked into one. So I bought four in the last couple of years and because I can roll everything into it um, and I had none of these incentives. So every single one of mine is at that list price where they're at. And so I'm hoping for and working for appreciation past that. The people that are coming in now are actually getting it lower. And then when uh, interest rates um, relief comes, it should come back up here and then they should be growing along with what I've already purchased in the last year and a half. Well, and, and the builder that you've uh, been friendly with and, and gone through, Steve, uh, I know that they uh, are friendly to outside yeah. lenders. They don't have an in-house lender or an affiliated lender relationship, which is where Troy comes in so right. that they're able to, they they'll give you those incentives and say bring in your lender you can buy down the points or whatever and use your lender which is awesome because a lot of times those lenders are going to offer those super you know uh, super rates that they've already bought up but in, in fact Troy do you want to talk a little bit about that i know that we're speaking to investors and investors that are m more savvy tend to to watch our program but uh sure. just for someone that may not have that education as to how that happens. How can they offer this and everybody else is here? Yeah, it'll, and at, at the end of the day, and you can correct me, Newt, if uh, 
if you feel differently about it, but really they, they build it into the price of the home, right? Everything's, it's, it's not money from thin air when they're buying down the interest rate, when they're doing all these different incentives, they know what their margin's gonna be, what the cost to build is, and then these improvements they do to the property or the interest rate uh, mortgage uh, help that they may be able to provide is, is part of the price of the home. So from a house hack standpoint, what I like is that you're, you're essentially able to finance that, right? You're able to leverage the situation, leverage and finance the improvements that you may not have been able to do uh, outside of the builder, uh, incentivizing some of that. So like you said, with, the, with doing the yard and some of the finishes and things like that, well, you, you, you'd hate to have to pay that out of pocket on top of purchasing the home down payment and closing costs. So if you if you buy it for slightly more and then you've got all that already done and, and, and the incentive is built into now the loan, essentially you finance that. And I think that's what you've done, Steve, is you've taken advantage of that with, with your property. Yeah, the, the builder that I prefer has subs that will do, you know, the air conditioning, um, you know, little things like the landscaping and the fence are nice to have rolled into, you know, kind of the PITI. That way I don't have to pay for that out of reserves outside of that. So I get one lowest cost. Um, Troy, are there any programs out there that allow people to potentially um, additionally fund for the um, options that they are going to have after the purchase? So say a builder has, um, a standard offering and it doesn't have the fence or the landscaping or maybe even the basement. If they want that stuff done, is that a separate loan they have to go get after the fact? Or is there any, any products out there that allow them to have both of those things in one payment? Well, yeah, in the, in the mainstream product portfolio, you're not going to have something like that. They're going to, you know, the loan's always going to be based off of, the lower of the purchase price or the contract uh, contract price, excuse me, or the appraised value. So um, th- that's what they're going to lend. That's again the mainstream programs: Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA are going to lend on the lower of those two values. Um, so if it appraises for more, that's awesome and that's great. Um, that's good for the future. But for the for the purposes of the transaction, of course, everything's going to be based on that contract price. So uh, being able to finance those into the deal, so having them put those things together for you is is definitely advantageous instead okay. of trying to look for some financing after the fact or having to come up with the cash out of pocket to put the fence in, put the yard in, do the sprinkler system and whatnot. Um, I think that's just a wise way to go. Yeah. And it's going to be more expensive post-closing yeah. You know, there's some of the things about new construction that I think I've personally felt valuable is um, I'm I'm a hands off kind of guy. Right. I I don't. And I also, um, you know, I have the reserves set up, but if I buy new construction, I'm getting a brand new place and there's a, a one year warranty on the property for the small defects. And it could be anything from a driveway and and some of the flat work. Um, It could be, you know, the doors don't quite close in the right spots. It could be uh, any number of things. And so there's a process. We'll talk about a little bit more and going through that process and and, and the diligence and investor needs that generally a homeowner doesn't have that can make a big difference. Um, You know, having brand new things are not going to break down. So that's lower maintenance cost or any CapEx for a while. I mean, given anything could break, but you have a 10 year warranty on some of the HVAC stuff. Um, and, and so you should be hopefully able to have less, you know, repairs and maintenance over the first handful of years. And then it'll gradually step up. They're more energy efficient. Um, you know, they, they may be in newer developments where they have higher resale value and they, they might be in spots where people want to live. You know, you might have older neighborhoods that aren't commanding the rents that um, others are. And so one of the ones that, you know, we've bought properties in is one of the higher demand kind of cool, you know, farm to table uh, neighborhood where there's a water park and a golf course and a sledding hill. And you can walk down the street and pick cherries, or we just got through with everybody picking pumpkins and, you know, doing uh, all of those types of things. There's, you know, a, a premium to be either paid for to purchase or that renters that want to be able to live in that same area and give their kids or whoever enjoy those elements. So 
I see those as being some of the benefits of what, you know, um, some of the new construction has. Any other things out there, Newt or Troy, that you guys see that, that you know, investors seek in those? Uh, you know, uh, Steve, you and I have actually talked about this. I'm a big fan of those builders that also allow for a 10-year structural warranty. Because a lot of the times when they're building them so fast, you don't know if everything's getting done all quite right. So you want to make yeah, sure. that foundation. Yeah, exactly. Sure. And mm -hmm. nobody wants to have that creep up on them eight years down the road or even five and have to chisel out the basement floor because there's too much shift going on. So I'm a big fan of that. But I'm yeah, th there was one I, I bought a 2016 um, resale. Uh, and when we went through the inspection, there was um, a rafter uh, that was busted and they went through and basically said, um, you know, uh, they went back to the original builder and got it fixed. So they didn't actually have to pay somebody in there to do it. They were able to go in and, uh, you know, fundamentally get it fixed. And the builder that built the house originally is the one who, um, you know, covered the cost. So even when you're going to exit it, um, you know, there's an opportunity to have the builders do that. If you buy a 20 year old house or if it's been resold, you may not have that same thing. So that's, those are some of the things that, that I appreciate about them. And so they've got, you know, the highest insulation. So it's, and it's good for, you know, um, a renter to come in because they're getting newer items and, you know, hopefully they take care of them. We know they don't take care of them the way somebody with them in the own, but that's still a really good, you know, element of that. So. Can you, can you touch a little more Newt and Steve on the, how, how the rents look for those new houses, how they are, are they going to be how much above market that you can expect or look to uh, uh, rent that house for? You know, here's a brand. I mean, it's not very often that you can go in and rent a brand new house. Um, Steve, you're actually in in that market. I mean, you're. Yeah. There. So, you know, we, we bought one uh, over in Loveland in what, 2021, I guess. And um it was one of those where the market was really hot and, you know, that was the chance. That's what got me into new construction is I was out working on putting $25,000 over asking on properties and still getting beat out. Right. The difference with the new construction at that point, it was like buying an iPhone. If you go in and buy an iPhone, you pay their price and that's just it. But you don't have to compete with anybody it's got, they don't care about your financing or how much you put down, which a lot of sellers go, oh my gosh, these people are putting 40% down. They must be a better, more qualified buyer. Right. So I'm going to pick them. And, and it's really not the case, but sellers look at that. So um, the one we bought over in uh, Loveland, we actually had a contract to rent before we closed. So it was like, we really need to make sure we close. Nice. So we closed. Um, I put in a Nest doorbell, a Nest thermostat, and we put in blinds. And then four days later, it was rented. So we only had four days of, you know, owning it before we had somebody in there. So it was, it was, you know, fun and scary because, you know, if the deal didn't make it through, we weren't, you know, uh, expecting it to have a problem. But, you know, you, you always know that stuff can come up. But um, And those, we were able to work with our property manager um, and so that cash flow day one, which it was at a much better interest rate. Right. Um, one of the ones we have that's here in the neighborhoods we live in now. Um, sorry, I've got sunlight popping through the gray, uh, through the, the blinds. But um, I was pleasantly surprised this past summer when we were able to get rents that covered, um, you know, a 5% down. So it was 95% loan uh, uh, to value. And the rates were basically they cover the entire PITI. The only thing they don't cover is the property management. So it, it was, you know, it, it was awesome to be able to do that. And when we get done with the PMI on it, we should be able to be at um, uh, cash flow positive probably in another year and a half. But, you know, that's twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars a year to have a property that is, has, we have more in debt pay down and uh, we should have more in appreciation once things kind of get a little bit back on track. So, so we're seeing rents that cover those really well, but when you buy new, you know, and that's where we could, um, uh, we've shown some of those, 
If you get, you know, $50,000 off and then you get another 3%, if you can take $65,000 off of the list price and your loan then is at that rate, so say 500 and you're now borrowing for what, 435, that's a much better price point. And then you could potentially look at refinancing it to, let's say 6%, if we're at seven and a half and you can get it 6%, you'll drop that rate down. So I, I would encourage people to do their, their valuations based on on both of those. So, so Steve, do you, to Troy's question, do you have any stats that suggest that uh, new construction is going to be higher rents to start off with, uh, based on you know just thinking about how if they were to go into a new construction for an investment and uh, you know those get in those rates as of today with higher rents, then if there's a correction in the you know near future next year or so or whatever in, in the rates that are going to make that a better investment. Um, I don't know. Do you have any of those stats as far as? Yeah, I have said? more anecdotal. Um, so there were some properties from the, the builder that I like um, or have, have used most that they had one that was 50,000 off a, a popular model that's great with renters. And um, it's probably renting for about twenty seven hundred dollars uh, a month, and then you you know you might have pet rent. You can recoup trash and and non potable water we have up here, um, and so it it would be slightly cash flow negative. But you start out with you know fifty thousand or sixty five thousand in equity. So if you can do that for a year or two, then you know with rent potential increases, you have an opportunity to start getting closer to that cash uh, flow positive, but you've already built up 65,000 in equity. That's where, that's where, you know, having 2,500 or 3,000 for a year is for me a good trade-off to be able to say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to feed the beast $3,000, but I got 65,000 walking in. So now I only have 62, 62 still pretty good for me. And if I go, okay, I went, we, you never want to lose it, but if I had to give that up and then that's just on the list price, but then when you start seeing appreciation that you'll start gaining that back. I, I believe that's the way my investment, nobody can see the future, but that's, that's what I'm, uh, you know, working on and, and, uh, you know, feel like that. I think, you know, during the time of year, summer is obviously the best time to be renting because that's when the most people are out there trying to rent out a property this time of year, you might get a hundred or $200 less per month, but you might need to see if you can, you know, um, adjust that when you get back to the next turn. So um, that's, so I, I do think there's room in there to, to fund the cash flow negativity with purchasing equity. That's basically what, if somebody's comfortable with that, it's a great investment. Um, to be able to kind of take the long-term view on it. So I guess the takeaway would be that it's probably more common to be able to find that equity in new construction because they'll probably want to close out a phase or, uh, you know, they're just trying to move pro you know, product as opposed to that one resale that was grossly overpriced. That's right. the only way you're going to get that. And it went to be a stale property. That's the only way you're going to get all that equity if they just have to go. And, and that's the other thing is that, you know, people, if we're talking about just, you know, regular people wanting to buy a house, they don't want to buy a house and then have to fix it up because they may get a certain property value, but there's sometimes, unless it's from another investor that needs to sell it, like they got a 1031 it, those are more infrequent, but then they have to go in and spend some money to kind of bring it back up to date. It might need new carpet, new paint, you know, some blinds, you know, a fixture here and there. They've got to find that out of pocket. Then they've got to turn around and rent it. So it does make it more challenging for them to fund that. And what I like about some of the new construction is you can get some where you can wrap everything up and then you just have that delta versus your rent. And then you deal with that until, you know, your rent is above what your expenses are and you didn't have to pull as much out of, um, you know, your reserve. So if you're going to live in it for a year and you could put $25,000 down and buy $65,000 worth of equity, you know, that's, that's, you know, what a 250% um, return on investment going in. And then you just start working from there. Now it, having to give up a little bit each time you've got such leverage and debt pay down and those that 
it, it, it really provides a value. So um, at least that's, you know, yeah. that's my view on it. I was talking to somebody earlier and I was listening to a podcast on bigger pockets yesterday and they were talking about, you know, do you have problems? He says, no, I have puzzles. And it's how does the puzzle fit together? But that's based on what you need to see in your investing, you know, strategies, because it, it may not work for somebody else, somebody that's younger and wants to put more sweat equity in, it might be different. It's, it's, it's that um, just right for, for some. And, and those are the ones that are going to come in and say, okay, I can feed that beast for a year and a half or two, look at refinancing it. Then I've got a cash flow and property that's got more equity in it. And I've got, you know, uh, 65 or $75,000 worth of equity after a year and a half. Um, and because we all know that when interest rates do start to drop a little bit, the buyers are going to come off the sidelines and then there's going to be, you know, uh, a lot of competition and what that does for pricing, it takes it back up and then all ships will rise. Yeah. So, and you start losing all those incentives too uh, from the seller as and well. Uh, Newt was going to ask you a question, then I'll ask a follow-up. Sure, fire away. Oh, I was just going to ask when Troy was going to bring those rates down. Well, you know, I have it scheduled for <laughs> April 1st. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'll let everybody know. <laughs> yeah. No, just just our, our select group, right? You yeah. Know, we don't want everybody, you know, just, just our little... Our family of, of friends. <laughs> Troy, would you talk a little bit more about, I, I know we talked briefly the other day about, um, you know, there's there's builders that have um, some, they, they can either buy loans, buy loan dollars to be able to offer. They've got their own lender. How should people think about using, you know, like Nova Home Loans and or the lender and, and, and maybe they should look at both, but you know, what have you seen that you can either offer competitively and, and how might investors think about that when they're looking right. at new construction? Well, kind of along the lines, what uh, Newt had mentioned earlier is, um, you know, some of the builders don't have a in-house lender. So that's always great if you've got lending lined up and you're pre-approved, ready to go and can take advantage of any incentives that that builder can provide. But uh, some of the bigger box builders may have in-house lending. Uh, and they're going to offer incentivization for using that lender and give you some discounts, uh, maybe on buying down the interest rate um, or even the incentives or a combination thereof. So, you know, being able to take advantage of that is, is what you've got to do. It can make the numbers make a lot more sense in this current market environment. Um, a, an example that I had where and this was years ago with Richmond Homes as they were closing out a subdivision and they gave a hundred thousand dollars discount, but they had to use the in-house lending to get it done. But we came back post closing and refinanced it within two to three months and got them a better rate by three eighths of a percent. So wow. we 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 strategized. It's kind of a loan hack, uh, you know, hacking the house, but hacking loan where you you want to take advantage of any builder incentives you can, but if you can optimize the loan as well at some juncture in time or as soon as possible, then you want to do that as well. So um, in that case, you kind of take advantage of the hundred thousand dollars off, which was kind of to your whole point of yeah. you know, building that equity right away in that, uh, that purchase. And then, um, and then we optimize the interest rate shortly thereafter. And we structured the loan in such a way to where you're not spending a boatload of cost to do that first loan, you don't want to pay closing costs twice if you don't have to. Right. The way we went about it. But we had kind of a strategy going in and we basically did two loans simultaneously. They did a loan with the builder, put that together, uh, got it closed, and then shortly thereafter refinanced uh, yeah. into a better position. Because there's no prepayment penalty on that loan. And that's where the, the, the nugget for me on that one is, I think for investors is, you know, Explore your options. Don't just go with what the builder has, but but have conversations with somebody that's skilled like Troy, so that you know that, and 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 that way you have you know multiple options because there may be an opportunity to be able to do both, um, like right. you just said. You you, know, you may get in there and get that that rate yep. because you know right now somebody could go in and take the rate buy down, but if they go refinance it in two years, the value of that rate buy down today isn't going to be near as, as valuable because they're just going to recirculate it. 
it might be better to take that as a discount on the price right now versus or you know, upgrade the because they're the going to redo that in two years. Yeah, or upgrades to the home as well. You know, it's, sure. it's yeah, it's kind of the you're looking at it in totality. And there's situations where you know I can't compete with what a builder's lender is going to provide because they are you know they got so much built into the deal and that margin on the house that I don't have enough to match up. I mean. It, I, and you, you've probably come across this over the years where you've seen, you know, here's fifty thousand dollars, but hey, you got to use our lender. Well, you can't deny any borrower or buyer of that home to leave fifty grand. I mean, and I don't care if my rate is a half percent better. You know, you take on a little bit higher rate to take advantage of that fifty thousand. Sure. So um, that puzzle just, you're putting together that fits. Yeah, again, yeah, it's not the problem. It's the puzzle, like you pointed out. And so, just strategizing and kind of looking at the various scenarios and ultimately my, it's just kind of reassuring, you know, if I can look at it and say, yep, that's, that's a great deal. I, I would take advantage of that builder's financing <laughs> that they've got there. That's going to check the box in that area. And then we can always look at revising things if rates present themselves in such a way to be able to, to improve. You know, that's Troy, awesome. I'm glad you said that. I actually want to touch on that just so that uh, people understand that uh, lenders like you, that's how you know you have a good lender, right? When, you're you're looking at the deal for them and you're like that's an awesome deal i'd take yeah. that that's how you know you're working with somebody that's on the up i appreciate that yeah yeah and it, it is what it is i don't begrudge people when when you see that kind of opportunity i would take advantage of it too for crying out loud yeah <laughs> and that's that's what we're all trying to do is help people get you know the best so so let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about some of the challenges that um you know people have in in buying new construction and you know, yep. one of the things that kind of jumps out right off the bat is is it's a different contract um, and, and, and investors may be familiar with that or not. But most of the time, the Colorado real estate, you know, uh, contract is a fairly standard one. And Newt and I are um, correctly trained and licensed to be able to co consult on that or be able to, to be able to administer that contract. Builders have different contracts. Builders have contracts that favor them. And so Newt, maybe talk, you know, just a little bit about that and representation, because some of these um, some of these buyers or excuse me, some of these um, builders have representatives and they may or may not be a realtor. And, and what does that mean when somebody goes in to talk to them? Hey, yeah. can, I, can I throw a little bit in front of you, Newt, on sure. that? Um, just from my experience, it's it's huge absolutely huge to have somebody like new and Steve representing you to go in and buy a new construction, new home and, and, and new, you're going to elaborate on this, but from my experience on my side and exactly to your point, Steve is that the builder's looking out for the builder, the contract is slanted towards the builder um, and they're all different, you know? And so having a representative that knows the contract and can review that contract and then hold the builder's feet to the fire um, when you're dealing with the builder's agent, they're representing the builder. And so you want somebody representing you and it really doesn't change your pricing on buying the house. The builder puts more money in their pocket. The, the agent representing the builder maybe get a little bump or incentive for double siding it, right? They're representing the builder and they're, they're bringing the buyer in as well and representing the buyer in, in whatever capacity there. So um, I've just seen so many occasions where maybe there's, a defect in the house when you do a walkthrough and your representative having Newt there to say, hey, you know, we need to have this flooring uh, addressed over here because it's not right. And uh, and negotiating with the builder, we've I've had a lot of, even recently in the last few months where the flooring wasn't right, something wasn't done correctly and, and having somebody representing you to get that done because you're spending a fair chunk of money. You want to, you want a quality as well built house as possible. So having that represent, representation to walk you through the contract and hold the builder accountable um, is is priceless in my book. So having news uh, is, is huge. Oh, I agree. And thank you for bringing that up, Troy, because a lot of the times, uh, to your point, Steve, a lot of those builder reps are unlicensed salespeople. And so they directly work for the, the, the builder. Yeah. And so they may be your best friend and, you know, Hey, we're, they, they might've been a licensed agent at one point in their career, but they've had to put their license, their license on the ice because the builder won't allow them 
to continue to be a licensed real estate agent. Because it'd be held to a standard. <laughs> <laughs> They're still supposed to be fair and honest in their yeah. dealings, but uh, ultimately it, it is, to Troy's point, it, it is important to have their own representation because as a buyer, because like you said, Troy, I, I've gotten a lot of kudos from my clients in the past where mm -hmm. if I'm, if we're going through a walkthrough a week earlier, and then we're coming through and we're not seeing things getting done, I will call the, the builder's rep every hour, all day until it's done. And then they just get sick of hearing from me yeah. because that's what I'm there for. I'm here. I'm here to protect my clients. Right. And, you you and don't that, want that's, this. That's, the builder wants to close. They want to close and get their money and then, oh, we'll take care of it after the fact. And that's yeah. where new comes in and holds your feet to the fire. It's like, hey, we'll just postpone closing until you get the stuff done. Yeah. But they once, you know, it's like lending money to a, a friend or a family vendor. <laughs> they they want it up front and, and they'll do everything to get you to lend the money. Then when it comes to payback time, they'll they'll get to you when they when they get to you. And the builder, the builder wants to sell more houses. So all the contractors are down the street working on the next house. They don't want to come back and clean up things that they did before. So, and a lot of times they may run into those warranty things. Oh, well, don't worry about it. It's under warranty. We'll just mark it here and we'll get it yeah. done. But what they don't tell you is that they have that whole 12 months to get it done. And, do still, repair. and still, yeah, exactly. So we'll sit in the house there for, for months and months with, with stuff that's wrong. You know what? I've, I've been at more than 18 months. I, I think the one thing I want to add on that is as we as um, licensed Colorado real estate professionals, we're not able to provide as much um, guidance on builders contracts. So that's where we tell people that, you know, speak with your attorney and, and your lawyers. But what we can speak to is we do know how the, how the builders work. Um, we, we, you know, we'll follow up. Uh, there's a lot of people that go in there and when they don't have representation, let, let's just take radon for a second. If you don't ask about it, they're not going to mention it. You buy the house and then you find out, oh, you talk to your neighbor and say, oh, yeah, I talked to the builder and we had a radon inspection that was part of the, you know, pre-build inspection. And the builder will pay for the mitigation. And Prior to closing. I, yeah, and I didn't get that. Well, that's because you don't know how the process works. And that's where new build does some of that. Um, you know, th there's there's a lot to be done in those that being diligent. And we'll talk a little bit more in the considerations. But, you know, w when you're looking at buying, there's some. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about some of the different nuances is that let's talk about options and earnest money and money going hard. A lot of people aren't really familiar with that because on a resale, if I go in and do an inspection and I go, I don't like the way this looks, I go, okay, I, I can you know get out of that and I can get my earnest money back because there's something that I have met the standard of the Colorado real estate. But in a builder's contract, once you sign that, you start to run into things where you go, you're in it or you are out some funds. Talk a little bit about money going hard and, and earnest money. Yeah, I'm not a, a huge proponent of those builders that do require an upfront non-refundable deposit. Uh, oftentimes, it's a significant amount, around like 25000 or so, which is, that's a lot of money. And when I have a client that says, okay, we're going to do this, it's like, great, you're buying this house. Because if you don't, you're out that twenty five grand. But as far as like when it comes to like the options and stuff that you were just talking about, Steve, um, the uh, well, now I'm losing my train of thought because I've started getting upset about this non deposit, <laughs> right? <laughs> it really wakes me up. Yeah, I'll, I'll let me throw something in, uh, Newt. Maybe you'll come back to that. But um, keep in mind that the upgrades and the money that goes hard on those upgrades do get applied as a credit back to you at closing, but the money. Money's gone hard. So if you're put doing a 5% down plus closing cost, whatever upgrades, options, whatever money you've put up front, earnest money or upgrades money that has gone hard, that does apply towards your bottom line. So it does reduce the cash to close. A lot of times clients have questions right. about that. True. That yeah. And you're, you're correct in that. I, I'm just, uh, if it's not closed, there's still an opportunity for it not to close in my mind. So I always, always want to try to protect my buyers. 100%. From, uh, yeah, that's where, you know, if you're going in, you, you better be all in because, you know, sure. there's some uh, builders that if you say, hey, I want these options, the moment you sign saying I want these options, you pay half of those 
in earnest money again as, as that. And that money goes hard the moment you write the check. So if it's 12 or $20,000, that money, I mean, there may, I've seen some people be such a, a gadfly in pain that, that the builder finally says, I don't want to deal with you. And they might, they might do that. But for the most part, the builder wrote the contract to favor them and, and that, you know, it makes business sense for them. But, you know, that's when you need to say, you know, what, I'm all in on this. And, and I and I feel bad for the people that if they had a job and they lost their job or something changed or you know, something like that in between, you know, all of a sudden they're in harm's way. They can't finish it. Well, that earnest money, you know, goes over to the builder. And then they that that's the way the one I bought in Loveland. Now, I don't know how the money went hard on that, but there was it fell out of contract. I got a call and said, hey, I have this one. It was one of the models that I liked. Um, it was literally like, okay, let's go. And so I, I had to go over there with a thousand dollar check and say, okay, I locked it up. And then I had to go through the same process, but I had to be all in. And if I wasn't, don't start. But that builder, like you said, is a thousand dollars, whereas as opposed to five or 20, but it was right. about nice. And we did see a lot of the fluctuating interest rates as they were rising last year and this mm -hmm. year as well. Uh, that that knocked some people out of their contracts and they still lost their money because of those yeah. non-refundable deposits. But I, I did remember what I was thinking about when you were talking about options was the excessive options that uh, builders are oftentimes going to take, you know, half the cost of an upgraded item or a feature like granite or hardware on your cabinets and stuff like that. This isn't typically a problem for investors. Uh, because they're not necessarily trying to deck it out with all the quartz and, and gold toilets and everything. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, once they start pitching in, those do become non-refundable. Uh, half, you know, typically it's half the cost of the upgrade is yeah. going to be that non-refundable deposit. And oftentimes if, if they get a little out of hand with that, they definitely are going to lose that money if they pull out of that deal. So, yeah. Let's just talk a little bit about, you know, as I look at these investors all have um, levels of properties, you know, kind of the A, B, C, D, you know, when they're in some of the D's, they're not worried about a lot of things with them. When they get the C's, B's, buying new property, new construction in an area, um, you know, one of the things, the reason I like the builder that I, I, I've been going with is they're kind of a production builder. They've got Formica countertops. They have, you know, carpet. They have some vinyl. It's a it's a really good rental product. Uh, you know, I've known some people, some other investors that went in and said, well, I was going to put, you know, granite in eventually. And I just it's not the way I think. I put in a few things. You know, there's certain things that they put in that are builder grade, like there's a faucet in the kitchen sink that's that's really kind of heinous and probably costs seven dollars. Well, I'd rather go spend 90 bucks on a big swan neck one that when somebody walks in, they go, oh, that looks nice. So, you know, some of the options that investors want to put in, you know, they may want to be careful about making it for them to live in that, that fits their needs versus what is probably the right level for renters. And I'm not saying that renters don't like nice stuff. It just might be that. I, I put in a Nest doorbell and thermostat in each one. And I've talked to some of the renters like, oh yeah, I don't use it. Well, I was trying to put together like a tech package. So it might be a little bit more attractive. You've got a, a MyQ, you, know, uh, uh, you know, garage door opener. You've got, you know, a yeah. Wi-Fi thermostat and you can see people on that, that security. You know, some of those things are kind of nice to have in the house for some people. And some people are like, yeah, I don't use them. Right. Yeah. It depends on you know what you think. So I spent uh, what a Nest doorbells three hundred bucks, and the therm maybe it's the other way around. And the thermostats, you know, three or four hundred dollars, and so it's like eight hundred dollars for the two of them. But I thought that's hopefully going to get you know a better um, a level perceived of upgrade. Yeah, yeah and, and perceived. So you know, people have to make decisions about that. Um, we're kind of moving along pretty quick here, um, or, or we're covering a lot of territory, so we might not have to cover it all. Um, I'm not going to really talk about um, construction delays because, well, let's take a quick second and talk about them and what that has to do with the loan. Um, because if if I have a, a, a new build that's going to take, you know, um, four months that they're projecting and I get a loan locked in with Troy, what happened? Can I lock in long term loan commitments? And what happens if my builder moves uh, the timelines back on me, Troy? 
Yeah, there's there's definitely long term locks are, that are available, uh, but they get more costly. The longer the lock, it can be a little more pricey as far as the terms of the loan go. So uh, the shorter the lock, the better off you are. So you want to make sure. And again, this is where Newt and and Steve, you guys come in to, you know, make sure that the builders chipping along. <laughs> yeah, bring the hammer. Yeah, <laughs> make sure that they're moving along in a timely fashion, especially when you go to lock because now you have a date. So I usually try to lock it reasonably um, within the closing projected date and maybe give it some padding. Uh, there are some extensions that can be done to the lock, um, which you'd want to take advantage of if the market's moved away from you. Um, so Troy, it's let me ask you the two things. Um, when I lock in and say it's for 90 days or 120, um, yep. and I know those costs, Two things. One, um, does the amount that I pay as a premium up front to lock that in, does that apply towards the closing cost, towards my loan cost, or is that just a fee that I pay? Yeah, and I'm going to say it depends because there are certain situations where it does count as buying the interest rate and holding it. And sometimes it's here's the rate and it's just to hold that rate. So there, there are different scenarios and could be packaged different ways. So okay. kind of a vague answer, but but it's truly the case. And, well, and then, if I could, because my, my experience uh, was a couple of years ago that they were a couple of weeks behind. So I would, so my loan commitment um, for an extended lock was um, all went towards the loan cost. And then when it went over by, I think two weeks, I paid more to be able to, to extend that, but those still went towards it. So I kept paying, but it kept helping, I guess. I, I wasn't sure. just paying a fee. So yeah. are there different programs people could talk to you about that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Different ways to different, different lock levels, different lock timeframes will, will have different uh, requirements, like 180 day lock. I've never been a fan of super long locks uh, because they're, they're, the pricing is just so uncompetitive. And if the market stays flat, the rate's going to be so much better on a 30, 45, 60 day lock than what you would have gotten with that 180 day lock. So it's really, you're doing long term locks if you're really anticipating the rates to head south. And in our current market, we're, we're seeing pressure that should improve the rates, is what we're uh, leaning towards. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just touch uh, and we can talk a little bit about um, the dreaded term metro taxes and HOAs. So um, before I started investing, you know, metro taxes, I didn't know a lot about them. I didn't really understand them. And now that I have a handful of properties that have metro taxes, I, I have a different perspective on them. And, and just to kind of help people understand, I'll see if I can frame this up right. Metro taxes are bonds basically that help fund the infrastructure of uh, a planned um, development. And HOAs are what we normally think, they're the homeowners association that puts the architectural con constraints and, and others that basically are the operating rules of the neighborhood. And there's a cost for both. And sometimes, you know, I have some where it's got a higher Metro tax and very low HOA, but the Metro tax, provides a lot of things that we do pay for through taxes. Or if there's no Metro tax, you may have to pay $15,000, $20,000 more for the property up front because they don't have a Metro tax and they have to have each house contribute to the funding of the streets, the sewers, the lights and other things. So any other comments on HOAs versus, you know, uh, Metro Metropolitan districts that you guys want to add in there that, you know, uh, people should know about? Uh, I'm actually seeing that there's in certain neighborhoods, the metropolitan district is acting kind of like an HOA. So they've got the yes. governance, the governance, everything. And uh, from, uh, I don't know, I'm not a CPA and I'm not a tax professional. So someone would want to talk to them, but it seems to me that would be advantageous because you can more than likely write that, that off. Can't you? Troy, well, I know you're not yeah. a tax professional. I'm in the same boat. I'm not uh, a CPA <laughs> or a tax accountant, but but my understanding is, and again, consult your tax professional, is that your, your your taxes are going to be deductible. So by them binding those HOAs within the taxes does create some advantage. 
and it's rolled into their payment, whereas HOA payments are not. So that's right. a separate payment, which yep. is something that they need to consider for their debt to income. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think on those, the other thing is just, you know, some uh, investors buy in places. It's just always good to look at the HOA to see what their regulations are. Uh, because there's been some HOAs that started to say that um, you needed to live in it for a year. They were trying to fend off a lot of these I buyers that were coming in. So they said, hey, you know, one way to defeat the um, big corporate spending was just to say you have to live in it for a year before you can rent it. Most HOAs that I've come across don't have short term or medium term ability. So the neighborhood I live in now has a minimum rent of six months. And so you, you can't get a medium term, you can't do an Airbnb, you know, you have to know that going in and you look at those HOA documents. Um, so well, short term rentals in Colorado as a whole are, are kind of saturated. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, one other thing uh, that, that's a good and a bad about, um, you know, uh, new construction, especially for investors, there's limited choices. Uh, if you're a regular buyer and you have plenty of time, you can kind of pick it and know when they're going to release it and then put your money down on it. And then it takes time to build and then you buy it for an investor. You want to be saying, OK, I've done my due diligence on these kind of buyer, these kind of builders and these neighborhoods. And when there's an opportunity, I know what it looks like and I can pull the trigger. And so that's where, you know, with the builder that I, I tend to prefer, there's a model that I have a couple of that I know are good rental ones, which, you know, if that one comes up, it's a really good opportunity. And, and that way people aren't worried about, you know, him and Han, they've already kind of made the decision on the acceptable ones. And when it pops up with, as it gets close to being completed, the discounts get higher and higher because they don't want to have that sitting on their books. There's a chance for them to be able to take that, pull the trigger really fast, get into a place, get 50 or $63,000 off of that right at the onset. So um, you may not be able to pick the colors of the, you know, the floors or, you know, some of the house and that you get what you get and, but you get, you know, that um, delivered immediately. Any other thoughts with, kind of limited choices that, you know, are good or bad? Well, they may be limited choices, but they're newer, like you said. And I mean, even investors that have current uh, already, you know, they've already got rentals that say they were built in the fifties and they've just given them headaches with pipes or water heaters or whatever. I mean, maybe they want to list it and they yeah. want to move up into a new construction because, you know, they're maybe that price point of the, the previous rental makes sense to list it, move the money over 1031 if it makes sense to uh, gain those tax advantages and get into a new construction that has those warranties and stuff. You never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those and those are good things. You know, speak, speaking of the warranties, just as an investor that has purchased new construction, one of the things I found is it's being really diligent because the builder is um, in a business that they want to sell you a house and they want to get on to building the next one. And when, when you're looking to, to purchase, you know, some of the things that kind of get in your way a little bit or just to understand is, you know, uh, talk, you know, maybe Troy talk about appraisals for a minute, because a lot of times they're scrambling to meet a deadline. It's still got a lot of things that aren't done two weeks out. You need to do that final appraisal. Oh, yeah. You need to do the appraisal to say, yeah, it's pretty much going to be that. But there are times where you have to do a second appraisal. And then sometimes you have to do an appraisal after the fact or a, a check after the fact. Talk a little bit about what your experience is with that, or I can share a little bit what I've kind of gone through, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to your point, uh, a lot of times we'll do the appraisal a little bit earlier on and the house is not complete. It's not finished. Maybe they don't have the cabinetry in or the uh, functionality fully engaged for the house. So the appraiser has to go out and, and do a final just to make sure that it's done because we're we're doing a loan from a lender's perspective. We're doing a loan on a property, residential property uh, that needs to be a full functioning property. And if, if you put a loan against a property that's not there, they, you know, they're not in the business of owning the properties. They're in the business of collecting payments on a mortgage. And so they don't want to deal with a foreclosure that's a partially built house. So there is a final inspection just to make sure everything's done. So again, having, Noon on your side, making sure everything is ready and coordinating to get that appraiser out there a day or two before closing, if that's the case. 
and and then closing on time with a finished house. Yeah, those second appraisal visits kind of frustrate me if we have to do those because I know my client's typically going to have a a little bit of an extra charge for that usually is yeah, yeah. the case. So yeah, that bothers me, and I try to to coordinate it with the builder so that uh -huh. it's like, hay, hey, are you guys done? Because we need yeah. to let's let's save some money here. <laughs> well, Newt, I'll I'll take care of that for you. Uh, <laughs> you, you if, even if there's a final inspection, we'll get that taken care of for your client. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk just a little bit of inspections. Uh, you know, inspections are another one because you've got a property that's getting close to being done. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's new build, you've already spent your money. You've got, you know, your earnest money's gone hard. So you're still going. And so the thought process that I use is, you know, I'm going into this. I just need to figure out how to manage all the way through it. So I go and get an inspection. I get a, a sewer scope um, and I also get the radon. And so I do those. Very important. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah. It's super important. I, I tell all of my clients, home occupants are not, or investors. If they're getting new construction, you absolutely should do all of the inspections you normally would on a resale home. Just because it's new doesn't mean something hasn't popped loose while they were building it. So yeah, I, they could be driving over these and crush the sewer line stuff. I've like had that. firsthand experience with that with a client that was buying new construction, working with Preston Newberry. And, and I would have never thought of it from the lending standpoint to do a sewer scope on it. They sewer scope brand new construction and the, and the sewer line was crushed. Mm -hmm. and, and so they had them repair it. They went back in a second time. The sewer line wasn't done the second time. Right. So again, that's, that's where having a, a good representation professional like you guys representing you on a new construction deal comes in handy because you wouldn't, you'd think, Hey, everything's gonna be perfect and fine, but uh, they didn't backfill it correctly and they crushed the sewer line and, and maybe you would have been fine for a few months. And then all of a sudden you would have had a problem. And then the builder's not going to come out there and fix it until yeah. they're ready to. Then it's their problem. Uh, that's a nightmare. Oh, I've got stories. There or, or whatever you're living in there. That's, that's a, that's a problem. That's so having that deal pretty close was huge. Well, and that's where, you know, uh, different inspectors do it different ways. What I like about the one um, that I use is, I get an inspection report that's super detailed. The challenge is if it's even 10 days before it closes, there's so much that's still getting done. And then you go through the final walkthrough. So there's the inspection and then you go through a walkthrough and that's where that's the blue tape, blue tape trip. And I take the inspection, which I've developed a little bit of a relationship with the warranty guys. So they you know, have been very responsive when I ask for things that are supposed to be in there. But when you go through that, that warranty or the, the walkthrough, the one thing that I do, um, cause I've learned through a little bit of experience is sometimes you'll get, um, a lot of blue tape and sometimes I'll just take the tape off the wall and you go in there and you go, well, that didn't get fixed. If it's As not the on the sheet they give you. So like sometimes I'll scribble something and, and you, you literally need to say, is that, is that the piece on it? Like, is that written down correctly? Cause if those two don't match up, they go by this one. And then you have to take your inspection and go back and say, okay, I'm putting this in my 60 day warranty. And it's like, th their goal is to try and minimize the stuff they have to deal with because, you know, they don't want to deal with you any longer than they have to. They're not being rude. They're just, they're on to the next one and they're not there to cater to you forever. Yeah. As an agent, I learned to take pictures of the blue tape rooms so that That's a smart I, just idea. Throw them, I just send them right to my buyers. And then when we go through that final walkthrough, we have comparisons. Because yep. I've seen that a lot. Well, and that's where taking a picture. So some of these guys that do the final walkthrough have very bad handwriting and it's just kind of scribbles. So I, I make sure that, you know, it says what I say. I take a picture of it and then I, I take that in my inspection report. And that's what I use my one year warranty on. And then at 11 months, I do another light inspection and they go through the original inspection to see if all those things were cured or they go through... Um, anything that we might have uh, come across during that time. It's like things that have changed or, you know, something that we discovered that we didn't discover previously. Um, and so it's, there's a real skill to it. Um, and, and for me, I'm breaking in a house or I'm, I'm trying to get it ready to, to last as long as possible. And what happens is a lot of people get lazy and they don't, they go, well, I asked for it twice. No, I just create a list. Here's my punch list. And I work on it through the year. Um, I had a cracked driveway. They replaced the driveway on two properties. 
Um, you know, th there's little things where they need to raise this and you learn from each one. You know, there's just a door's not closing right. You think, oh, well, that's no big deal. Well, you know what? It is a big deal because if it doesn't close right, you got to live with that. And so you can go back. Some of those things are on there. So most people don't know what they don't know. So they sometimes don't ask for those things. So it's it's a great I think it's a great way to go. But you just have to be diligent like everything else and have processes set up and know how to, you know, make sure that you're holding, you know, um, your builder accountable. I, I've been in this place since last May. There's things that just got completed this week. I think the last one. So and we got new driveways in a month ago. And that's what I love about your situation, Steve, is that you guys um, have been doing this for years and you're walking the walk. It's really cool to see you go through this so that you can share this information from a, an experienced perspective as opposed yeah. to just theory. I appreciate it. So yeah. uh, we're about at the hour time period. Any other nuggets? I'm going to recap a couple that I heard, but um, any other nuggets that you guys have that um, investors should know that uh, help them make a great decision, either purchase you know, equity going in or how they should think about loans or any other things that kind of popped into your heads? I, I just think reemphasizing having somebody like Newt working with you uh, and, and you, Steve, to make sure that you have representation with these builders because they know the reputation of the builders. You, you found a good niche builder that's putting out a good product. And you know the reputation. They came back and took care of the warranty work. So just your knowledge and experience uh, to is has a lot of value that you bring to your clients. Thank you. So, so the things – yeah, go ahead, Newt. Oh, I was just going to say thank you, Troy and, and Steve, but also uh, would they also need to have good lenders like you, Troy, because it's important to have that experience of having gone through this so many years. It's it's it, you you just don't know what you don't know. And a lot of times you just have to rely on on the experts like us that have gone through this and gotten the bumps and bruises throughout the, the years just to figure it out to to help with that. Right. Yeah. I think that's when I when I pull back the lens just a little bit on that, it, it really tells me about having a good team that has a lot more repetitions. A lot of investors have a number of, of, of repetitions that they've done. So I've got a certain amount that I've done in the way I've done them. Newt and, and Troy, we've all got different aspects. But when you put us all together, an investor, you know, can really benefit from, you know, kind of seeing some of the things that we see. And we see those because they're going to have certain repetitions that they've done and what they've um, you know, accomplished so far, but it may not be in this space. It may not be in the new build space. And so there's a new space that they go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. I don't have to buy something, go and spend a bunch of money fixing up and then keep uh, you know, running the maintenance. And I've got a roof that's going to be in five years. I've got this. You know, Knowing how to work those things is I think really important to have a team like this available. And so we're, you know, I think, collectively able to provide people with more knowledge to help them make great decisions. And it may not be what fits in their model, but if it is, we can help, you know, make that a reality in the way that um, they're trying to project out how to build wealth. Well, and, and to that point, uh, when the best, when's the best time to buy real estate it's today, it's today. <laughs> regardless of the rates. That's right. Well, and that's where I'm uh, working with Troy right now, you know, personally to buy another property. And um, because between now and February is going to be a great time and, and there's opportunities out there. So um, I guess, how about I wrap it up uh, for, I guess, Troy, Newt and Vision Advisors and Nova Home Loans. If you guys have any questions about new bills, please feel free to reach out to us. It'll be in the show notes. And, um, you know, good luck with everything. Have a, a great rest of your week. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks New. Guys. Appreciate you guys.